Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another amazing pod. Late Night with Chefs, back at it again. Truffle Boy, aka Vlad Bryanston, is here with Tyler Brassel, our newest guest member and our newest series. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Tyler Brassel, the man, the myth, the legend. Cheers. Cheers. He made us some beautiful old fashions. We'll also be making cocktails. Um, little by little. Incremental change. Yeah, so. Makes good results. Um, I haven't really, nobody, I know a lot of people that follow me personally are gonna, are gonna know, you know, who, who Tyler Brassel is. Uh, but to everybody kind of learning about you today, what was, what was the thing that inspired you to become a chef and go down this journey? Wow, that's deep. What inspired me? Um, my mother is, would hate me, but she knows it's true. My mom is a awful cook. God awful. And uh, growing up, it was like, I didn't want to eat pancakes all the time because my mom would just come home and be like, I don't feel like cooking. Let's have pancakes. And so we'd have pancakes multiple times a week. And I was like, God, I don't want this anymore. So I would just cook something. And then I just started watching Chili Child and, and those guys on PBS way before Food Network. And I would be like, I can do that. That looks like fun. And I would just start messing around in the kitchen, making a huge mess. And like, my parents would come home and be like, what the hell? And then I'd be like, but look, I made tomato sauce. So that's how it started. <laughs> You know, um, not a bad thing. <clears throat> I'm just gonna turn up the volume here on the mic. All right, all right, that's a little bit better. And then uh, when I was when I was I turned like 14, 15, I wanted to buy a car, and my dad was like, get a job, and the town I grew up in was really, really small, and it was like the only options were a restaurant or a grocery store. And my brother worked at the grocery store, so that wasn't going to happen. So I started working at this little mom and pop Italian joint. And as as your first experience when you walked in there, was it enticing? Did it grab you? Like, what were those kind of first shift, first day? Oh my God, it was a like shithole, and I was scared to death. Literally, it was horrible. But. I don't know, I was just like, I just make this through and I got through the day and then at the end of the night we're all just sort of hanging out and reminiscing of the day and well, this is cool. It's like a group of people, you know, um, it's only 14. Um, but it was fun because it was different. There were people that weren't like me. And in, in that sense, what does that mean? I was like this farmer kid, like grew up in a really small little area. Now I'm hanging out with adults that aren't my family, you know, but I became a new family. So I don't know, I don't know how to describe that, but it was, it was fun and exciting and crazy. And I mean, we were just, we all worked really well together and just, and just got it done, got a job done. And the other night you're like, yeah, we did that. And then what would you say, you know, what age is this at? And then I worked there from when I was 14 until I was uh, almost 18. And then I had to go to college and I wanted to join the military. And my dad was like, no, go to college. The military, really? Yeah. And uh, yeah, my dad was like, you can go to the military after school. Had I known then what I know now about it, shit, I should have gone to the military and then got out and went to school. Right. But whatever. So I went to culinary school because you know, I thought cooking was fun and I liked it and let's just make a career or something fun. <clears throat> so went to culinary school, 18. Scared to death again, but same thing, right? Like meeting new people and, and making connections and, you know, all sort of in the same boat together. It's 
funny. Gotcha. Okay, let's and then fast forward. We'll jump back into culinary school. Yeah. Again. I went to culinary school when it wasn't cool. Like, all right, let's just jump into it right when, now. When I, it was, I'll just jump into it when right it was, now. When it was, when it was convicts and fucking, yeah, it was not cool. When it was like a, like a hand, like a skill, like a service that you went to school. Yeah, it was like, like a, a trade, trade, school. trade school. Yo, yo. I mean, there were, there were a couple, you know, celebrity chefs and stuff, but. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the cool thing to do. Being a chef wasn't cool. Like when I told my mom I wanted to go to culinary school and be a chef, she cried. See, for me it was the opposite. It, I wanted to go to culinary school. Right. And I want I know. So mm. it's it's nice to have that parent back you up, but at the same time then you have that person that kind of want to prove and be like, see, he told you I wanted to do this. and Oh, yeah, she sings a way different song now. My son, the chef. You know, and like I go over, to, go over to my parents' house for like, you know, a Sunday supper or something, and my mom pretends like she doesn't know how to cook a damn thing. You know, she's like, can you do this? And of course, I just take over and start doing it. But like, what the hell did you do all week? And to feed yourself all week, right? You know, but whatever. I like it. It's fun. No, I always take over the kitchen where, wherever I'm at, even at like a family gathering or anything. Even at a random kitchen, I'll. Mm. There, there's something about like I want to cook my own food to me personally, and I think a lot of chefs have issues with that. Is at the end of the day of cooking for everybody else, you don't want to cook for yourself. And like I've tried to, I've put, I've made it a habit to overcome that, and now I'm almost like OCD when mm. it's not me touching the food. Yeah, but there's a thing. Like, I mean, you know, we both do it. We we eat crappy food at the end of the night. Like we put out like yeah, but it's like when we do that, food. it's like rolling the dice. Yeah, but it's like you just don't want to. You don't want to do the service. You, yeah. You know, I mean, I love it, but you know, when you're when you've done a twelve-hour day and you're like done, you're like, eh, I really don't feel like cooking. Right. People think that we have this like glorious lifestyle, like we come home and you know, cooking fire like, on yeah, like the fridge, the fridge is full, like Just eating caviar and potato chips, yeah, while watching TV. Mm -hmm. But I think those moments do happen. Oh, absolutely. You know, there's a surplus. There's a this, there's a deal, there's a that, and we take advantage of it. Sure. So kind of going back to the journey after culinary school, what was what was Tyler Brassel doing? Oh wow. Um, um what were your next five steps? I had an instructor in school who was like, if you really want to move up the ladder in this business, go work at some place brand new where like everybody in the same place is on the same. Right. Uh, and so I did that and I, I found a restaurant that was opening independent. So before we talk about that, was Michelin a thing? Was it talked about? Was it taught about? Yeah. Was it fantasized and I it was not idealized about, right? Not in this country, no. But, but in culinary school, was that a prevalent subject? Like, was that something that was like, I'm going to be a Michelin star chef? Or was it, I'm just trying to cook cool food and enjoy my life and make a decent living? Uh, no, culinary school wasn't either of those. Culinary school was like, learn how to do all this stuff and then figure well, it's out. It's not learn how to do it. It's do all this stuff, right? Because... You learn about it in the class, but then you actually physically have like yeah. every kid that graduates culinary stool, uh, stool, uh, school has made uh, yeah, yeah, stock yeah. and stock and holidays and, and the basics, right? Yeah, of course, of course. But that if you was... don't keep practicing it at your current job, then you kind of you lose it. I don't, you know, I don't think that you lose it. I think that it's just sort of. You need to get it refreshed. Yeah, sure. it's just sort of put there in the background, and then like something comes up, and you're like, "Oh, how do I do this?" or "What's this?" and you just sort of 
do it. And that's what I think differently when I went to culinary school than what it is now. Like when I went, it was like hardcore, like this, 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 this. There wasn't much creativity in culinary school. I would have hated it then. Probably. It was very military. Because I was so creative that my chef was like, yo, chill. Learn the basics. Yeah, there was no the foundations. No creativity. It's funny because uh, Chef Rob was like, I made a compressed watermelon dish. And he was like, do you even know who created that initially? He's like, my friend, mm. Omar. And, I'm yeah. like, oh, shit. <laughs> and he's like, you're making a fucking shitty version of it. So how about you learn the basics first? And, you know, those little moments in culinary school, as much as in the moment you're like, fuck this guy, fuck this place, I'm so much better than this, they humble you because then later on in life when you get other people to tell you the same shit, you're like, all right, maybe I should fucking get this shit checked. Right. Get my, get my, you know, fundamentals grounded before I start thinking this and that. And I did that. I went, like, I went back and re-solidified you know those fundamentals you gotta you gotta you, you can't you can't do anything if you don't understand the basic right right so culinary school <clears throat> go to this new restaurant everything's new yeah well no everything wasn't new the restaurant was a shit hole oh uh but it was a new restaurant how can it be a new restaurant and a shithole? Well, because it was a restaurant previously. And then somebody just bought it and was like, okay, we're this today? Yeah, they, so it's interesting is that the, the restaurant was on the water, like on the waterfront, beautiful, whatever. And uh, if you look at the building to the left was like a, like a driveway. And originally that space was like a boat launch, mm -hmm. but they had closed it off and built the restaurant, whatever. And uh, somebody drove her car off that ledge, and the restaurant was called The Gangplank. I'm not kidding. Not the restaurant that I worked in, but the restaurant previously was The Gangplank. Okay, and so someone that drove sense. off the... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, then the, the guy that bought it, Walter, was really super cool and owned a bunch of restaurants and knew what he was doing. And uh, we built the new restaurant. It was beautiful. The front of the house was amazing. It was on the water. It was gorgeous. The kitchen was old and had never been renovated. So what what, what was your day-to-day -day like, and what were you getting paid an hour to do that? I think it was like the highest paid job I had ever had up until then, and I think I was making like $9 an hour. That's not that bad. I thought it was going to be more steep. Yeah, that's like 9 bucks. And this was one, like... 1996. Jeez, so I was one years old. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah. I was still in fucking Ukraine. Yeah. Chilling. Yeah. You were out there busting your ass for $9 an hour. Nine bucks an hour, that was big money, dude. No I, joke. I think it, it is. Even in that time, like, that was big money. But was it, there was no overtime? There was no... Oh, yeah, there was. There was overtime? Right? Yeah. Yeah. The minimum wage was like four fifty. Yeah, I was making big money. That was huge. Another thing that's on my mind today. Like, how did guests not know it's time to leave? If you look at the restaurant, the entire restaurant is completely empty. Everybody's cleaned up. The bar is cleaned up. Everything's ready to like literally flip the switch and put the lights off, and people are still sitting there. Do you have friends like that though? No. But have you been around people like that? You know what I mean? Like, there's just, there's just that type of person. You gotta understand it that, in their mind, their perspective and their reality is. I paid. Oh. They're still. I mean, obviously, it's because we work in the service industry, so we we have a different appreciation. But like, I I, I don't know what world do you live in where you don't. I don't know. That was tonight. 
I mean, we were verging on an hour for that last table to leave. Everybody else had left almost one hour before. But they came, you know, later and they spent their money. I think it's different when it's um, corporate versus personal. No, I mean, even owning restaurants for years, like the end of the night, you're like, start turning the lights up. And it's like, okay, people, take the hint. And go. I don't get people like that sometimes. I mean, I've encountered, you know, like people staying till four in the morning at a Russian banquet, which would be unacceptable anywhere else. But some people have an understanding and they're willing to pay. Like, they're like, hey, look, I know you're keeping your people longer here. Oh, yeah. Hang out and pay yeah, extra. sure. Like, that's the type of people. That's different. Like, you know, that's different. Yeah, you put yeah. 50 bucks in everybody's pocket, stay two hours later, nobody's going to complain. No one's going to complain. But then there's those people who are like, you know, ignorance is bliss if no one's kicking us out. They've already paid their bill and like, come on, guys. You know, I don't know. This is me. I don't know. I think the client's always right, you know. No. Would you rather have not taken that? Table, you know what I mean? Oh, of course you want the revenue. Of course. So it's like, you know, it's like those one one out of not out of nine out of ten tables is gonna be like that one out of ten tables that's gonna cost you more money. Yeah. Yeah. But sure. nine are sure. You know. Mm-hmm. Um you know, it's a di- it's a difficult area that we're in because. It's, okay, here's another so future future conversations down the road. But like, why don't people take the time to write a positive, like send an email and be like, "Wow, thank you so much. It was a fantastic evening." But the same people that take the time to bitch. I think because of um, you know, there's that analogy when the house is clean, you don't. You know, you don't go twice about it, but when the house is dirty, you notice it. Mm. So, like, I guess going deeper in that is, like, it's expected that they're going to have a good time because they're paying money for it. Okay. Fair. It isn't expected to have a bad time and pay money for it. Fair. Fair. I've sent far more emails about good experiences than I have ever about bad. And you know, I could easily. Well, and that's the difference between service or industry people and yeah, people who are in the field. And, and this field is massive. So, you know, from and then, like, we keep learning about all these new niche markets that are because of the internet, because of the world, because of the way things are, it's coming about that you can make you can make a living just writing recipes or submitting recipes for a recipe contests and winning all of them. You know what I mean? Um, there's those people who find a bargain or a deal on something and are able to sell it. So it's, it's just a wide, such a wide market. I mean, people are eating all the time. The question is, is what you want to feed them or they willing to pay for it? And I think that's where the biggest mm. failures are in a restaurant, right? Because you bring in the food mm-hmm. to the restaurant. Like you're deciding to put this chicken dish on the menu. Is that what the people that are coming there are making the reservations going to buy? No, well, it should be. Like, I mean, ideally, it's not for the most part, but ideally, it would be like the people are coming to experience what you're making what you're excited about making. Like how cool would it be? And there are lots of chefs in our industry that do it, but like the items that you're excited to eat and the people come to experience what excites you. But it's like such a, I think the pandemic kind of, (laughs) it took us back 10 years, I think. Mm -hmm. For sure. We're back, we're back in like, 08 when comfort food was like 
or or am I just catching the trend late? Because like I think comfort foods, it's it's been a mix of like this this uh, mish fusion of you know super low end and super high end ingredient mm-hmm. on a dish, you know like fried chicken and caviar or potato chip salt vinegar potato chip with caviar you know like those things are more and more popular it's like bringing that comfort yet luxury Mm -hmm. in one bite i think that's been you know up trending nowadays but like are we ever you know restaurants that are opening nowadays are they they say you know we don't want to be this uh cookie cutter like we want to have a little bit more freedom and creativity but like you think that those you know stiff places are, are what's that proper word for it this, this stuffy mm. type of environments you know that they used to say that you know at the, at the michelin environment you have like three four waiters at the table at all yeah, times there's, I mean, there's always going to be a place for that but i think most people but then how do you justify charging? How cool would it be to, to open a restaurant and literally expose the whole thing, and all the expenses and everything? Like everything. We'd be like, hi, welcome. This is how we get to what we charge you. And this is why, and like, here's everything. That'd be crazy. Like, that's just like, the whole expose it all. I don't think people want to see it. I don't know. I think it might be something. This is crazy. I just just had this thought, but that'd be kind of crazy. I just think I see what you're saying. Like twenty five cents for the tomato, thirty cents for the lettuce. Well, that, yeah, but that's that's just all obvious shit. Like, what about the other stuff? Like, you know, Greg dropped that plate, and that plate cost twenty five dollars. For the actual physical plate, right? I think that would be not to mention the show that's on it, where you know you tag all these things, like the price is right at a restaurant. Like I've always dreamed of having a restaurant where all the employees see everything; it's complete transparency, and they all understand every single thing adds up. But do you think that's that's a reality? And like, how do you cultivate? A culture to to entice those people in your business. Well, I think that if all, if all the employees are vested in it and they understand it. See, like my my next challenge is like, how do you build a brand around your name to invite those young culinary people that want to learn? And do you have enough to offer? And then this and like. You know, a lot of people my age right now who are very talented, you know, they have this imposter syndrome mm-hmm. where they think, well, well I, well, I can't charge that much or I can't do that or I can't do that because they're like, they know it, they know how to do it, but they're scared that people are going to judge them, which, you know, I don't have personally, but I see a lot of people mm-hmm. in the field, even your age, I feel like, you know, imposter syndrome is a big thing where it's like, you do something really good and great, and well, they don't. You judge yourself for it. They don't. They don't. I think a lot of people just don't think that they have the skill set that others do. But the difference is, the others actually put themselves out there, right? Well, it's it's controlling your narrative, right? What people see, right? And what people perceive. You have two people that can have the same skill set and are capable of doing the exact same thing. And one of them just happens to be more vocal and more out in the public and, and whatever. And the other person is like, no, I'm just gonna sit here and cook my food. Who's gonna get the who's gonna get the sale? Who's gonna get the money? Right. Right. And that's the thing, you can be the best, but if nobody knows you. Mm-hmm. And and the thing comes with it's a it's a two way street. You either have enough money to survive that Mm. that beginning and fund that like Enigma did right there's a lot to do right? three yeah. four or five months of not having maybe one two three four or five people till it, it caught on mm-hmm. 
or you know I think the social media route where you showcase what you do and then be like here I'm open for business sure. and when I opened the table in Orlando uh, social media was just sort of taking off and I didn't embrace it as much as I should have that's my own fault but like People are like, what do you mean I don't get choices? What do you mean there's no menu? What do you mean I have to buy a ticket? Like, I wish I could do a great Gary V impression and be like, come on, bro. <laughs> like people were perplexed, you know? And I, it's a new technology. Half the people, I will say, half the people were like, hell yeah. Done. I don't even have to think about this for the rest of the day. It dinner. Dinner's done. Like I, I booked it. We're gonna show up, we're gonna have a fantastic time, we're gonna have the best meal ever, and I don't have to make a damn decision. Mm -hmm. Like, those people, super excited, and those were the ones that were booking months and months and months out. Right? How cool is that? Especially yeah. not to be, I don't know how to, uh, just to be that person that, like, you're responsible to book date night or whatever, you know, and you're like, done. You know, and you're, partner, wife, whatever, whoever is like, oh my God, it's done. Yep, done. We're going to go. We're going to go have a fantastic fucking time and not have to make a single decision and not have to worry about anything. So, so, but back in that day, I think it was, it was, if you were on it, you got the, you got the extra business for it, right? Because mm. there is not everybody listed on that list. No, but there were the people that were like, what, what do you mean there's no menu? What do you mean we don't get to pay? What do you mean I got to pay for it before we even get there? Like, And that's the that's the suffering of you're paying money to educate your mm -hmm. consumer mm -hmm. versus giving your consumer what they want. Now, do you think that our consumer these days is much more educated and they know what they want and they seek out exactly what they want? Definitely. Definitely more people now get it. You know what I mean? Like I want sushi tonight. Let me see what 10 options for sushi is. I want Oh God now Uber Eats and all that. There was that never existed. So yeah. But do you think that's going to continue to be a thing where there's that separation of restaurants and people and like people like eating at your house while watching TV is, is like a filthy experience compared to dining out and having a dialect and a face to face while enjoying some sophisticated food like food food shouldn't just be to scuff down and i feel like whatever you order take out you end up scuffing down yeah or watching a movie yeah you know, it's not an experience not registering what no you're not getting the full dopamines i feel like from your meal versus like going out to experience it one like, i don't know what the fuck i uber eat two weeks ago Right, but you can tell me about the restaurant experience that you had two months ago. Right, for sure, for sure. And, and the people, and, and then just the whole frequency exchange of mm -hmm. positivity. Yeah, it's an experience. It's the whole package. It's not just eating food. Right. Connection. Now, with with the whole food truck, I think the food trucks thing is like. It's working in some states, it's not working in others. Like Chicago is never gonna allow it to be a thing. Mm -hmm. There's food trucks, but there's maybe 20, 30 for the entire city. Food trucks, man, those people bust their asses. They do. They, they do. really, really do. More the so. city makes it hard for them to serve food, but at the same time, the city wants the business to get the business. They want brick and mortar business. Yeah. The lease. So, so it's very political. Well, in mean, a food truck, they don't have to pay for a brick and mortar. So they're able to have lower expenses overall. But that Generally, comes, but they still pay it. That comes at an expense. The expense is way more labor on themselves. And I mean, way more maintenance. Yeah. but you're, More often maintenance. Sure. Sure. I mean, it's hard, man. I, I know a bunch of people that own food trucks, and it's, it is... Hard. I want to lie. I want you can make good money for sure, but it's hard. It's and solid the thing, the thing that, like, as a young, say, still young, 
crazy that I'm fucking whatever. But <laughs> question is, do you go brick and mortar or food truck? And to me, it's a safer bet to go brick and mortar and build up your business, please. Yep. You know? Yeah. And I think cocktail heavy is the way to go nowadays because people don't want to eat a lot of food. People are, are watching their figure more than ever. People are health getting healthier mm -hmm. more than ever. Mm -hmm. So like giving them good bites of food and I think people want experience. They want to have the the night out. I think that's becoming more of a thing. Like it's not like, oh, let's go to the restaurant and have a meal and then go out and do this, this, and this. It's now become more of a the whole package. Yeah, we're gonna go here for dinner. Let's have a night out. Let's have a whole thing. No, I definitely see it and and that's like where we're headed. You. Um but yeah, I think this is a good this is a good spot to wrap up the pod. You know yeah. Heather Heather Woodford. We'll Heather Woodford or with thirty. This was Woodford Time with Late Night with Chefs, Tyler Brassel, and Vlad Brian Stiv. Uh, make sure to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Vlad Brian Stiv, Tyler Brassel. You find something, make sure to subscribe, like, leave a thoughtful comment. And as always, we'll be back with some more great talks, conversations, some inspiration, some real life shit. And, um, yeah, Tell us what you want to hear.